scripture, a reading from Genesis in chapter 2, verse 15 through 17, and chapter 3, verse 1. The Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now the serpent, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had, cre had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke from chapter 23, verses 32 through 35. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others, let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The Word of the Lord. The story of Genesis. You have this beautiful garden. It says God created it, and you can only imagine it being perfect. Sunny and 72 mild breeze, just perfectly pleasant to be outside since there was no shelters yet. And God places Adam in the center of the garden to work it, to take care of it. God creates Eve, together they're in paradise. And God says, you can eat of any tree you want in paradise, except this one. Do not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, because if you do, you will surely die. And the serpent, who's more crafty than the other animals, goes up to Eve and says, did God really say you're going to die if you eat of the tree of good and evil? Did he really say you will die Scripture reading for today ends with that question. Will you really die? What Adam and Eve were looking for in the tree was to be like God. They wanted to know good and evil. Plus, it looked like a really good fruit to eat. It doesn't say whether it was an apple tree or a pomegranate tree or an orange tree. Depending on which painting you look at from the Renaissance, it could be any one of a matter of different fruits. But the reality is, is Adam and Eve felt a lack suddenly by the suggestion of the serpent. They felt less than. They felt like, oh my goodness, I'm not like God. I could be like God if I ate that tree. Maybe I should try it. Maybe this would be a good thing. Yeah, he said we'll die, but meh. If we're like God, then we can know everything. Maybe we can know how to get out of death. Because we don't even really know what death is yet, but... So Adam and Eve were tempted by this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the price was death. Fast forward to the time of Jesus. He has his 12 disciples, he's teaching them, he's loving them, he's curing diseases, he's walking the streets, he's preaching, he's challenging the Pharisees, he's flipping over tables in the temple, and he's praying with people, the poor and the sick and the lame are coming to him, and he's touching them and doing all these religiously unclean things and just making a mockery of the whole Jewish institution. So finally, the tables are turned and he's executed by the Romans. So Pilate gets him up on a cross and says, all right, Jesus, we've had enough of your ramblings, enough of this insurrection, 
The chief temple priests are saying that you're guilty of all these things. I don't really see it, but you're going to die. We just have to be done with this. So Jesus is put up on the cross. And when Jesus is up on the cross, there's two thieves with him. And he looks down at the crowd. And what does he say? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. Now, to be the devil's advocate for a turn of phrase, I would argue that the people did know what they were doing. They knew very much what they were doing. They didn't like Jesus. They didn't like his teachings. They thought he's going to take all the power away. He's upsetting all the different things. He's telling us to do church totally differently than the way that I like it. So I don't want to have to deal with that. Now, Jesus becomes the epitome of everything that everyone hated. He doesn't follow the law. He's fraternizing with the Romans. He's not a revolutionary enough. He's too compassionate. He's not strong enough. He's not holy enough. He doesn't follow all the laws. He's not, he's not this, he's not that. And people just said, you know what, Jesus? We don't want you anymore. We don't need you. And the disciples Jesus' closest friends and confidants, like Peter, James, and John, the stalwarts of the faith, they see Jesus on the cross, and what do they do? Jesus, we will stand by you no matter what. We will, oh, you're dying? I'm out of here. Bye! The disciples weren't even there when Jesus died on the cross. They were saving their own skins. But Jesus looks out at them and says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So we have to ask ourselves, how often have we been so sure of something, so certain that this is what we had to do? And to then think to yourself after the fact, well, maybe that wasn't the right thing. Maybe I didn't really know what I was doing. Maybe there was something I didn't know or something I didn't understand. Maybe there was some part of my vision that was blinded and I couldn't see. When Jesus is up on the cross, he looks down at the people. And what does he say? Oh, you miserable bunch of wretches. How dare you do this to your sovereign king and God? I will smite you for a thousand years of burning fire and flames. No. Jesus looks down on the people and he has mercy on them. He has compassion on them. And he even prays to God, God, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Maybe in the same way, that's the way God felt putting Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. When they took the tree, when they took the fruit from the tree, because God said, if you eat the fruit of that tree, you will surely die. And they ate the fruit. And God could have just smited him right there. Boom. I die. I die. But it says their eyes were opened. They became aware of the knowledge of good and evil. And they became ashamed of themselves. It says they covered up their nakedness. They hid in the bushes. God came looking for them. And they were afraid because they knew what they had done was wrong. Now, in the garden, it wasn't necessarily the tree's fruit that had the knowledge of good and evil. It wasn't the fact that they ate it, and somehow by ingesting the food, they became super knowledgeable of good and evil. It was the act itself. By disobeying God, they knew what it meant to be evil. By turning their back on God, they knew what it meant to be ashamed for disobeying the one who had created them. For taking the fruit, they knew what it meant to do something that they thought was in their own best interest instead of others. And God didn't smite them right in that instance. He comes up to them. He calls them out. He says, who told you you were naked? Who told you to be ashamed? 
And wouldn't you know it, God is the one who actually gives them their first outfits. It says God gave them animal skins to wear and sends them out of the garden. In some ways, I can't help but think that God, in his infinite mercy, looked at Adam and Eve and said, oh, you don't know what you're doing. You didn't know what you were doing when you took the fruit, and now you've got sin in your life, so now you're even more not going to know what you're doing. Can you even know, God would think, what I am going to do for you? Because God gives Adam and Eve a second chance. Yes, they are going to die, but he sends them out. He sends them out to have a family. He sends them out to live in the world he created. It's not perfect and idyllic like the Garden of Eden, but it is still the world and it will provide for them. And indeed, Adam and Eve live for hundreds of years and they have children and they do start to populate the earth. And the story of creation comes from this idea that God wants the earth to be filled. He wants us to be fruitful and multiply. And the simple fact of our disobedience is not enough for God to smite us. How many of you who have had a child who has disobeyed you and you thought to yourself, that's it, you're executed? (laughs) Zero tolerance. The human race would have perished after that first generation, right? You know, But there's something in us that gives us compassion when people don't understand what they're doing. There's something in us that gives us patience, that when someone does a boneheaded thing, we think to ourselves, you really didn't think this through all the way, did you? We're the boneheaded one. And God is looking at us every day, saying, you really don't know what you're doing. But there is one thing that we do know. There's one thing that I know, and I pray that you know it too, and it's that God loves you so much that even though you might do the most vile and atrocious things, you might turn your back on God, you might think to yourself, I want nothing to do with this. If you admit you need God, and not just say, oh yeah, I need God, and come to church and, you know, pretend to be holy. But if you really deep down know that you need God, he will be there for you. Jesus got himself executed, hung up on a cross, and he could have been upset. He could have been spiteful. He could have been mean-spirited. I'd have a few choice words for the folks who put me up on a cross. I'll tell you that. Why did you do this to me? Why did you do this? I was trying to help you. But not Jesus. To know Jesus is to know that he is ever merciful and prays for forgiveness for the people that put him on that cross. Do we know that God? Do we know the God who is infinitely merciful? Do we know the God who gives us a second chance? Do we know the God who will walk alongside us and help us when we need it? Because to know God is to know God's benefits, to know God's blessings, to know God's promises, to know God's word to us. For even though Adam and Eve sin in the Garden of Eden, even though each one of us has gone home after a wonderful church service and sinned against God in word and deed sometime during the week, when we come back on Sunday, we come back because we say, God, forgive us. Help me. I want to be a better person. I want to know what it is to know God, to know you. And we can have that. Today, we extinguished the first candle. We heard Jesus' words from the cross. Words of compassion and forgiveness. 
may we too, who know God, be ready to offer forgiveness to those who ask it of us. May we be willing to assume the best in someone rather than assume the worst. May we be willing to give of ourselves and even admit maybe we don't have all the answers or that I'm not right and say, okay, I think maybe you are right. Someone else is right. That other person over there is right. Because the Lord forgives me because I don't know what I do. So I'm going to forgive this other person when they do something that wrongs me. So friends, as we know God, may we know His blessings. And may we know what it means to have a loving and forgiving God. From the very first sin in all creation to us here today in 2020. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for your forgiveness. From the very first sin, Lord, you forgave Adam and Eve. They did not get to live in paradise. They did not get to live forever. They disobeyed your word, Lord, but you gave them a second chance. Indeed, Lord, you are a God of second chances. So help us, Lord, to be patient. Help us to be mindful of your calling to us. Help us be willing to offer forgiveness to others and to be patient with others as well. For you are a good and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.